ESPN celebrating 150 years of college football. Football, the youngest art form, the easiest understood, television in full and captivating color. Television has played an enormous role in the growth of college football. TV is the great uniter. It's like the big living room or the big stadium. Because of technology, television makes the experience more visceral than ever before. It just makes it easier to actually feel like you're in the event. You're in your living room. You just get to turn on your TV set and you're there. You are looking live. TV has become really good at capturing not only the action on the field. Clemson strengthens its grip on this championship game. But all the color and pageantry of the game. You have what's happening pre-game. You have the smoke and the players running out with it. You have the fans and what kind of messes they've become after tailgating, you know, some of them since Wednesday afternoon. The speed with which media coverage of college football has changed has been really startling because that's a single generation change. There was a great hysteria starting in 1950. The NCAA decided television is bad for college football. If it's available on TV, people won't go to the stadium. And it worked out just the opposite. There's something palpable, something in the air with college football. And television has done a very good job of representing it. It is good! Presented by Cintas. Legion Field in Birmingham, Alabama is bursting at the seams with Crimson Tide and War Eagle supporters. The first game I remember distinctly seeing on television was the Alabama-Auburn game in 71. Alabama was undefeated. And here are the undefeated Auburn Tigers and their rooters. My babysitter at the time was an Auburn fan, and much to the chagrin of my family, for whom there was no wagering, I made a bet of 35 cents with my babysitter on the game. And it didn't occur to me at the time that should I lose, I didn't really have 35 cents probably to pay her. Second and goal. Terry Davis, touchdown, Alabama. Alabama won the game 31-7, and I collected my winnings on Monday morning when I reported to her house. She was very gracious and wonderful. But I remember watching that game on a pretty small television, lying on the floor, and I was just enthralled by the game, by the description, by the colors, by seeing something that I had been listening to on the radio, even as a five-year-old every week, but actually getting to see it. Metal fingers beckoning to the invisible, calling to sound the ear cannot hear and sight beyond the range of the unaided eye. Our era, the era of television. Television brought the sights and sounds of college football into your living room. It made you feel it in a way that radio couldn't quite match. Before, you were just listening to it on the radio back in the day, but now you are able to hear the words, but also see the action as it corresponds on the screen. Griffin has time, launches it to the end zone. Touchdown! Highlights from the sport news of the day. Fordham's coach, Jim Crowley, is said to have one of the strongest teams in the East this year. They're taking the field against the toughest opposition they've ever faced. It won't be long now. The 1939 season promises football fireworks aplenty. The first televised college football game was between Fordham and Waynesburg in 1939. That game, of which of course was in the old stadium on Durandall's Island in the East River, it wasn't even a big game to attend, much less watch on television. Television was just experimental. It was very rudimentary. It's hard to even imagine what it would have looked like in 39. It was a picture we would not recognize, a pale comparison to today. 1945, the war over. After four years of unparalleled sacrifice, the American public hungry for the rewards of peace. 
By the time the war ends and television starts to sweep through the country, more and more stations, there are four networks in 1950. There's ABC, CBS, NBC, and Dumont. College football was an easy thing to televise, uh, relatively speaking, because it was live. Everything had to be live in those days, no videotape, and it was relatively inexpensive. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Notre Dame Stadium in South Bend. There emerged in 1950 two teams that made network deals. It's in there! Uh, Notre Dame with the Dumont Network and Penn with ABC. Captain Red Spagnell leads his Pennsylvania squad onto the field. Not Penn State, not the Nittany Lions. The Quakers, the University of Penn, Ivy League. Red Spagnell again as he slices off tackle to cap the Quakers' drive with a touchdown. People forget in this day of Ivy League football that Penn was a national power. The Notre Dame Penn game in 1952 was played at Franklin Field in Philly and sold it out 70,000 people. Nobody else was doing that. Nobody else had the cachet in a major television market the way Penn did. Notre Dame had always been a forward thinker in the way it promoted its program. So when television came along, the university instinctively understood this is something that's good for us. Football is what gets our name out there. Father Cavanaugh, as you know, this game is being shown in the theater television audiences from Boston down to Philadelphia and up and down the entire eastern seaboard. The reason Notre Dame wound up with a big television contract was because a lot of people all over the country loved the University of Notre Dame, the Subway alumni. When you have people who might never see a game at Notre Dame Stadium, might never set foot in South Bend, television they saw as a big part of connecting them to the Subway alumni. Putting your home game on television, what that did for Notre Dame and Penn was revolutionary. You could turn on the television and watch Penn and Notre Dame. They were pioneers in that field. They were competing head to head. It's not like there was a television in every home in the early 50s, but they were coming into homes at a record rate. People in that golden age of television were hearing about I Love Lucy, and they wanted television for that reason in their homes, but there was also these sporting events they could get. First down, pull the goal for the Irish. The idea that Notre Dame football could come right into your living room, and you could see it, not just listen to it, you could see it. Oh, my God, that was huge. The Irish of Notre Dame opening the 1951 football season with a 48-6 win. Once Notre Dame seized upon television, it kind of scared the other schools, and it scared the NCAA. Notre Dame would get even more powerful and bigger, and the NCAA fought back and seized control of who got to be televised and who didn't. There was a great hysteria that ripped the college sports establishment starting in 1950. Across the country, teams were starting to see ticket sales decline pretty significantly. And they blamed it on television, because you could sit home and watch Penn and Notre Dame and whoever else was being televised locally. The NCAA commissioned a study to look at television's impact on college football. And it was a three-person committee, and they decided that, you know what? Television is bad for college football. If it's available on TV, people won't go to the stadium. Uh, what uh, other major steps you expect to take at the NCAA meeting in uh, Cincinnati? Well, of course, one of the major questions will be that concerning a television policy for the coming year. Out of this, in 1951, a bunch of colleges, through the auspices of the still really impotent NCAA, decided to ban television, except for one game of the week. Ban it. They said to Penn and Notre Dame, you got to give up those deals. Walter Byers ran the NCAA, and he was a young guy at that time, and he saw the telecasts of individual schools as a threat. Rope throws a strike to Houston. When the Trojans close in, he laterals to Lewis. Lewis races all the way unmolested to complete an 80-yard scoring play with six minutes left to play. I'm no economist, but I understand controlling the amount of product you allow out. And the less you allow out, the more valuable it is and the more control you have over it. It's a cartel. That's a monopoly. 
And Walter Byers, the NCAA, understood that better than anybody. You've got the Ivy Leagues, you've got the ACC, you've got all these conferences. It's very regional, and the TV is regional and so on. Once the NCAA connects them all, and then that connection gets stronger and stronger under Walter Byers, you start doing contracts together, agreements together, and so on. Now you have a national product. A national product can be sold nationally. That's one hell of a package you're selling because the passion for this is unrivaled. NCAA college football. In 1952, you have the first NCAA national college game of the week. And this was on NBC. It was one game on every week, 12 weeks, 12 games the entire year. That was it. Each team could only be on television once. Randy Duncan with the ball, throws, and it's intercepted by The appearances were spread out among the conferences, so there might be a great and important game in the Southwest Conference between Texas and Texas A&M, but if they had used up their appearances, then you were going to see LSU and Ole Miss. It was still sort of a regional thought process to who got on, and you just didn't get on very often. Touchdown, Kano! And the Cougars go out in front, 28 to nothing. It wasn't like schools could go out and make their own deals to be shown elsewhere, because they had ceded their television rights to the NCAA. The NCAA package was built on an act of thuggery. It was a really despicable act in taking away, bluffing Notre Dame and Penn out of their rights to their own television packages, because the NCAA didn't have the power to do that, but they made them think they had the power. This was a dark moment in the history of college athletics, and it set the tone for what was gonna happen in the 1980s. The NCAA very much used the fear of television to take control of college athletics. Welcome to the Bear Bryant Show. We're glad you could join our review of the exciting action of your University of Alabama's Crimson Tide football. When Bear Bryant takes the job in 1958 to come to Alabama, he was a wily guy. And as part of his contract, he demanded the ownership of the game films. When the NCAA took control of college football in 51-52, they were taking control of live college football, which is to say there was a loophole. Didn't say anything about replays on Sunday. Alabama could only be on television at the maximum in those days three times a year. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome once again to the Bear Bryant Show, brought to you by Ice Cold Coca-Cola. Mm. The Bear Bryant Show was your only chance most weeks to see any Alabama football. Hand off here to Billy Jackson, and you can see some running here. If you wanted to know what was happening, you had to listen to the radio broadcast on Saturday. You got to see the plays you had heard the day before, and you got to hear Bryant talk about the players that you had heard the day before. Some of us is a local boy. He wasn't a center. We made a center out of him. I saw his daddy after the game. I went to the University of Alabama because, to me, it was about winning. And I wanted, you know, I had learned how to win from Coach Bryant. It's now 42 to 21. We didn't make 42 yards against him last year. I can tell you, someone who grew up in the late 60s and 70s in Alabama, you rushed home from church wanting to watch the bear, this guy that you idolized. But I think what really won the game was, was what win most games is the people up front, the people in the trenches. The Sunday afternoon Bear Bryant show for people across the state was appointment viewing. Today we're going to show you that I've learned this technique. <laughs> it's really it's good. Good. <laughs> Well, I had a little accident, but uh, they're fresh anyway. <laughs> As a TV guy, when you go back and look at the clips now, you look at it and go, really, I felt like I had to see this every week? Coach, I believe we're back, and uh, Coach Bryant was mumbling, well, you know, Charlie, uh, he's got a good mama and daddy. Bryant, most of the time, talked as if he was gargling with marbles. Coach, we had folk down there. Real fine rush there, great play by the hook. And so he'd be sort of humming along, da 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 da, and then you know that big hit would come, and uh, well, yeah, I saw his mom and daddy. Bingo, bingo, bingo. 
Bingo, that's a goodie. But Alabama football was a source of pride for the state, and Bear Bryant was the point man for that success. Oh, hello, yeah. He used it as a marketing vehicle, not only for himself, but for the university and for the football program. Kickoff time for the Auburn game is 5.05. We're on national television again, and uh, we're playing around the Army-Navy game. We'll see you next week for Ice Cold Coca-Cola and Golden Plate. The way the coaches use television in their own markets, they became these symbols of what college football was and the great regionalization. This is Michigan Replay with Bo Schembechler, sponsored in part by AC Delco. All of the major coaches in those days had shows that would run regionally. We had just too many uh, turnovers offensively. Lindsey Nelson would do these Notre Dame highlight shows on Sunday mornings that were broadcast in 75 cities. The Irish strike again early in the final quarter. Pete Andreotti turns the right side, and before the Boilermakers know what hit them, Pete Francis over for another Notre Dame counter to make it a 28-7 game. When my brother Bob was playing in South Bend, I always remembered Sunday morning, TV on, and you hear Lindsey Nelson's voice. And we just saw the game. But we still, you know, sat there and listened to the highlights. I mean, that was, I remember those days like yesterday. Men saw the need for better communication and worked on it until they brought the marvels of sight and sound we enjoy today. There are three networks in 1960. NBC and CBS were fighting it out for number one. ABC was way down the list, and it had no sports division. None. NBC was the 800-pound gorilla in terms of sports. Kremblis passing, and he's got Jim Houston the 20 to the 10, and he is down at about the two-yard line. The crown jewel of sports television at that point was the NCAA package. It had become a really big deal, very successful in the ratings. Touchdown! When the NCAA was accepting bids in 1960 for its package at this hotel in New York, ABC has the high bid by about $100,000. It's a little over $3 million. When ABC won that package, outsmarting NBC, it was the beginning of the ABC Sports Division. The game of the week, another in the great lineup of ABC Sports presentation. Ed Sherrick, who is mostly forgotten in the history of college football, he's the guy who hired Rune Arledge. The greatest thing that Rune Arledge brought to college football is that he was not a sports guy. What do you want from me, Charlie Hall? He was producing the Sherry Lewis Lamb Chop Show for NBC. <laughs> he never produced a single sports program in his life. People have demonstrated that they want to watch sports events, that there is a real quality, a live quality, a happening now experience that they don't get in their regular things that are on television. Uh, there's a ship in the Navy. They're firing right into the Army section over there. But we're having this real wild get, uh, start over here. Well, Rune Knowledge was a TV genius in sports and football, which is one of the aspects where his genius was on display. He was a great storyteller, and he understood the power of storytelling. The way he did it in college football was to understand the passion for the sport in all the ways that that's on display. That one is good for the touchdown of Jim Luther. You know, at that point in 1960, the MO essentially was to have two or three static cameras from a distance. And he might be in there all the way, and he's in for a touchdown. Harlech took a more creative approach, far more creative, where TV is actually part of the experience. Shoot the cheerleaders, of course, over here. That's part of the spectacle. You show the bands for a certain amount of the time, the players running out. The Maze and Blue Warriors of Michigan. It becomes an actual production of the entire event, not just here's the ball, here's what happened. There's a wind now beginning to kick up a little bit more as our end zone camera gives you this shot. He sort of had a vision of creating something inside the telecast that is unique and different. And thinking about the technology before it was created. Like, we'd like to have this. You're looking at the first handheld, completely portable color television camera to be used by any television network. For me, a handheld camera is everything about my job, and I think what adds to the storytelling of the game. It's the perfect theater. It's a perfect movie. Guys like Rune have just made it bigger, 
and it's been awesome to watch. Because of the shocking death of President Kennedy, it was undecided for days whether or not there would be an Army-Navy game. The game was dedicated to the memory of the Commander-in-Chief, and the pregame ceremonies were solemn. One innovation that wasn't part of ABC getting the contract was the advent of instant replay. It was 1963. Tony Verna and CBS came up with the ability to show you a play that had already happened. They came up with instant replay for the Army-Navy game in 1963, and it changed sports television as we know it. Tony Verna borrowed a special lens from some of his buddies at CBS News, the same lenses that they used on the moonshots out of Cape Canaveral, because he wanted to get in close up. Army-Navy, late in the game, Army quarterback Roley Stitchway scores on a touchdown. Stitchway dived over. And so there was a replay of the previous play. The videotape of the first instant replay is gone. It was erased over. Lindsey Nelson was the announcer that day. He said, ladies and gentlemen, Raleigh Stitchway has not scored again. You know, and he tried to explain to them what instant replay was. Carl Stitchway tacks up his second touchdown of the day. That moment was a watershed event. And let's see it again in slow motion. All of a sudden, watching on television has an added benefit that you don't get in the stadium. Instant replay, one of the great inventions in the history of television. Watson takes a huge hit. Good evening. The U.S. Supreme Court today issued a ruling that goes right to the bottom line of one of America's biggest businesses, college football. For 33 years, the NCAA has had exclusive control over the right to television broadcasts of college games. Not any longer. Prior to 1984, the NCAA would restrict the number of games that teams could have broadcast on television, period. Got a man! So each team was allotted a certain number of, of broadcast games, and beyond that, you couldn't be on television. Enjoy college football more than a game. A lobbying group formed called the College Football Association, the CFA. The CFA wanted to basically break away from these NCAA rules and put their schools on TV as much as they could. The CFA, representing all those major schools, Alabama, Notre Dame, Penn State, Texas, negotiated its own $180 million package for NBC. It was essentially declaring war on the NCAA. Three of the top four teams in the country battle Saturday on ABC's NCAA College Football. The NCAA threatened our CFA members, and men and women would be ineligible for postseason competition if you implemented the CFA television contract. We ought to be able to market our own products. So Oklahoma sued the NCAA for our rights, our television rights. It was the universities of Georgia and Oklahoma that challenged the NCAA's quarter billion dollar negotiating monopoly with the TV networks, arguing that their schools could make more money with individual contracts to televise more games, giving viewers a wider selection. The Supreme Court issued a seven to two decision that the institutions then had the right to control their own television. The Supreme Court found the practices of the NCAA constituted a restraint of trade in violation of the Sherman Act. The NCAA acted in a, quote, classic cartel with a, quote, almost absolute control over the supply of college football. The NCAA at that point is disallowed from restricting schools' abilities to contract individually with the networks. In the summer of 1984, the NCAA is out of the TV business. This was an earthquake in college athletics. It's unclear how today's ruling will affect the schedule for televised games this fall. The president of the NCAA said this afternoon that chaos could erupt if teams start scrambling for TV contracts now. There's a strong possibility that there's going to be a lot more college football on television. I think it's going to be a couple of years before this whole decision really shakes itself out. 
Is oversaturation your primary concern now, Mr. Gibbons? Well, I think that uh, the, the main opportunity that we're looking for is to find out whether there is such a thing as oversaturation or find out how it happens because as long as the NCAA has had exclusive control over all of college football, we've had no opportunity to find out these things. There were predictions at the time that this would lead college football straight into a ditch, that the glut of product would mean that the schools would get less money. And it did, for the first year or two, go down. Now what you have is an overexposed product, I mean, meaning college football. I think this, this bad experience in television is showing an awful lot of people that the NCAA was right in the first place. Now, Michigan is not overexposed and never will be overexposed because we're just not going to go on. We have $8 million worth of tickets sold. The most we have ever made on television is $700,000 in a year. Now, you're not going to jeopardize your in-house crowd with unlimited telecasting. I think it's going to hurt, well, I know it's going to hurt the, the smaller schools. I strongly feel that the court's decision abolishing central NC2A control of television will destroy the very structure of college athletics. No major school should telecast more than three times, four maximum, never should. I think that it's going to be such a bad experience this year that sanity is going to prevail. Pretty soon, the schools signed away those television rights that they wanted so desperately. They gave them to their conferences. So the conferences could then package the television rights and go to the networks and have the networks bid for them. TBS Sports presentation of SEC football is brought to you by Delta Airlines. The conferences went out and cut their own syndication packages. And so, overnight, the number of college football games increases by a factor of three. And here are the Kings now. Into the end zone. Touchdown, Miami. Today, you got college football everywhere. Why? Because of that lawsuit, what happened in 1984, what we did then to sell and fight for our product on our field for everybody. Next week, Notre Dame goes west against the Falcons of the Air Force Academy. The CFA entered into a TV contract and Notre Dame was supposedly a part of the CFA contract for the early 90s. Well, much to my amazement, about two weeks after that, they announced that they were having their own TV arrangement with NBC. NBC is proud to begin its exclusive coverage of the Irish home games for the next five years. Notre Dame broke from the CFA in 1991 to sign this NBC contract to air all of their home games. It's a remarkable deal. It's way ahead of its time. We're only minutes away from kickoff at Notre Dame Stadium. The Knowles and the Irish getting ready. And we'll return to South Bend in a minute. You know, you grow up, you know, every time you turn on the television, Notre Dame always has a game on. Before I understood anything about having the television contract, I knew they were always on television. Why the heck is that? If you have something that someone wants, they're going to pay you for it. It's that simple. And the University of Notre Dame has a product I think a lot of people want to watch. Knocked away! Notre Dame wins! 31-24! When NBC got Notre Dame, everybody was like, man, Notre Dame and NBC, can't believe what an advantage for Notre Dame. And now it's like, everybody is on TV every week. I'm pleased to announce the launch of the ACC Network. This is the SEC Network. Now, schools and conferences are free to negotiate their own television deals, and suddenly it's all about how do I get into the conference that will get me the best possible TV deal. That Supreme Court decision, more than anything else, touched off conference realignment. An independent no more. Penn State kicking off its first year as a member of the Big Ten. Colorado on the move from the Big 12 to the Pac-10. It's really radically changed the traditional conference makeup of the sport. Conferences get more money by having a bigger footprint. The last round of realignment is a great example. The Big Ten plucks Maryland and Rutgers. The ACC raided the Big East by moving up the Atlantic coast where there are more TV sets. And it is caught! Touchdown! 
The math is simple. The more schools and the bigger footprint you have, the more television homes you can bring to the network and the more they will pay to get access to those television homes. I don't think it's any coincidence that just when the Supreme Court decentralized the televising in college football, here was ESPN with all this time to fill, and it's just gone from there. We're just minutes away from the NCAA college football preview. College football built this symbiotic relationship that was extraordinarily beneficial for both the sport and certainly beneficial for the network. I think it gave our network in the early days great credibility to be able to broadcast these games. It is number three UCLA and number two Nebraska. A great showdown on ESPN the second week of the season. This is in reality the maiden voyage for ESPN truck number one. But in the next few days and months and years, it'll be traveling many miles up and down the West Coast. And along the way, it will be bringing you such outstanding events as NCAA football. Touchdown! With the birth of ESPN, they needed programming. College football contracts back then were the networks handpicking from about the same five teams week in and week out. It was limited. You had all these leftovers. Not leftovers. I mean, this was prime filet. This was top shelf stuff sitting there waiting to be feasted on and ESPN comes along. He's got all kinds of running room. He needs one more block by Cheetah. Touchdown. What ESPN quickly proved, even in its earliest years, was that there was a market out there for more college football. Now, College Game Day with Chris Fowler and Lee Corso. And good morning. Glad you're with us as we steamroll into week four. Lee Corso will join me in just a minute. We were enormously proud to build College Game Day brick by brick from a show that was really on life support in the early 90s. They weren't sure they wanted to keep it. It was a half hour studio show. We are just across the street from Notre Dame Stadium at the Ed Joyce Center live for a special College Game Day. Finally, some wise people made the decision to take the show on the road for the first time in 1993, Florida State, Notre Dame was an epic, hyped game, perfect place to showcase what game day could be. And welcome back inside the Notre Dame Heritage Hall. It was crude. We had no idea what we were doing. It wasn't shot well. It wasn't mic'd well. It was in a Hall of Fame. So we were not ready for what the show eventually would become. But from that weekend in South Bend, we knew that college football was uniquely suited to have an on-campus pregame show. These guys are definitely revved up. The network saw what happened and liked the reception it got, and so then they decided to take it on the road more. And the rest is history. This is not going to be a close game. Florida will win in a big, big way. I went to the University of Florida from 1996 to 2000. And when you're good, college game day comes to town. The Gators have it in. They're going to get more active defensively, and there it is. Florida Gators. I remember running up to the barricade to try to get my picture with, like, Fowler and Herbie and Coach. Then, years down the road, I got to actually be a part of the circus. Oh, I mean, I get misty thinking about it. It was, like, one of the coolest moments of my career. James Madison, mother of college game day crowds. When game day rolls onto a campus, it's it's really hard to describe. Nice balmy day in Blacksburg, but then again, those guys wouldn't care if it's 40 below it. Game Day's emergence with the road shows helped make a lot of programs more nationally known than they were before. This is Game Day, and we're in Fargo. Game Day sites became a game of one-upsmanship. Who could show the most enthusiasm? Who could get the biggest crowd to turn out? Who could be the loudest, the nuttiest, the most memorable? And that was fun. It was a big part of the growth of the show. The Purple of Northwestern. It is still a really big deal to get game day in a time when, you know, TV's diminishing, people are doing stuff on social media, watching stuff on their phone. Game day still matters that it comes to your campus. When game day says it's coming to town, you're identifying that game as one of the biggest ones in the country, if not the biggest one. 
but you're also affirming that university in that city. The challenge for us as we moved around each campus was to show what is unique about this culture, what goes into the buildup to a game. Why is Baton Rouge different than Columbus? There are things they have in common, but they're also very unique aspects. And game day, I think, worked hard to showcase that. People know that you take boats to the game at Tennessee and at Washington. It's a direct connection to what Rune Arledge was doing a couple of generations ago. He's not just giving you the game, he's giving you the color and the pageantry. And game day has done that on steroids. <laughs> Give me my duck in! <laughs> College football Saturday can't start until Lee Corso puts on the headgear. There is no point in teeing up a ball and kicking off until this happens. Tennessee! <laughs> I'm making a living putting something on my head. Can you believe that? Okay. Boom. That's it. And the show is over, and Lee Corso put the mascot head on, and people are either cheering or booing, but whatever they're, they're going crazy in some form or fashion. That told the world it's kickoff time. The day's about to start. Let's play football. Who'd you pick? I pick old Miss. Oh, Come on. Miss. College football was such a regional sport. Television would take it from being a regional sport to a national sport. Here's Belage into the end zone. Touchdown. Arizona State. You'd think with national TV, that would water down the regionality of this sport. No, it's done the opposite. Because when you move from Ohio to LA, you don't quit being a Buckeye fan. You got the Big Ten Network in LA, so you're catching all the games, man. And if you're an Oregon fan, you move to Alabama, you're watching the Ducks. So it's made it stronger, not weaker, amazingly. We have made history in College Station tonight. Television takes you right there. You and your buddies all get together, and it's just like old times. You're 1921 again, wearing that blue blazer with the gold buttons, and you're at the game, a little bit hammered, sneaking in alcohol. You're reliving your youth, man. Thank you, television. We're in the fifth overtime. Edwards Elayers looks like he's gonna throw! Carter, touchdown! It's allowed all of us, if you're a big fan, to not just follow your team or your conference. Now you're living in the SEC, but man, what's going on with the Big 12 and all these points they're scoring? Touchdown, they did it! Now because of TV and the explosion of how many games are out there, you can have games on from noon Eastern to literally two in the morning. I mean, how great is that? <laughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Keith Jackson. I'll be calling to play for you this afternoon, and this is the dessert of our Thanksgiving holiday feast of college football here on ABC. In the evolution of college football on television, the last piece and the most visible piece is the guy who's telling you the story. And there's really nobody who's ever been better than Keith Jackson. Let it go. He's got three people down there. The ball's up in the air. Caught. Touchdown. Caught by Westbrook for a touchdown! Incredible! He was a brilliant announcer at a lot of things. Did a lot of sports at a high level. See, that last 20 feet hurt, didn't it? But somehow, his style, his personality meshed beautifully with college football. Framed by the San Gabriel Mountains, this is the city of Pasadena, California, site of one of the world's great festivals on this day, the Tournament of Roses. Keith Jackson, for a lot of us, was more than just describing the action. It was Americana. It was going back to what makes college football special to a lot of us. It's traditional. And it seemed like every big game for about 20 years, it would be Keith Jackson. Kick is up. It's long enough, and it's good. He made it. Keith's describing the game, and he's doing it in such a folksy way that that's what made him unique, and that's what made him the best. When there was a big play in a game, whoa, Nelly! Galloway, touchdown, Buckeyes! No flag! Whoa, Nelly! We were 
talking catchphrases. Keith Jackson had a litany of them, you know, the big house. For Merle, a big hoss of a man, uh, one of the big uglies down front. That's Keith Jackson. And a happy new year from ABC Sports. So when you hear Keith Jackson's voice, you settle in. I know what I'm doing today. I'm watching Keith Jackson. Let me get this straight. You go to sports events, college football games all over the country, and you get paid for it. Best job in the world. Growing up, my goal was to play at Tennessee and have Keith Jackson call my name and say, Charles Davis from New Paltz, New York. I could not wait for that to happen. And when it did, it was a memorable deal because all my people at home in New Paltz were like, Keith Jackson said your name. It's like, yes. And Charles Davis, the free safety at 190. I still remember Keith Jackson did Peyton Manning's first game as a freshman in 94. They were at the Rose Bowl, it was UCLA and Tennessee. Manning didn't start the game. He comes running in. Here comes Peyton Manning making his entry as the quarterback for the University of Tennessee. Get used to it. Get used to it. Just vintage, you know, and I'll never forget that call. He can take a boring game and make it sound fun for me. And the last game he did was our national championship game, which I sit and listen to a lot now just because Keith Jackson called it. He's going for the corner. He's got it. Vince Young scores. Oh, Nelly. <laughs> there was an evolution in terms of the voice of college football. It started out in the 50s with Mel Allen. This is Chick Hearn with Mel Allen. Happy New Year, everybody. Of course, Chris Schinkel. Well, Mr. President, uh, Bud and I are so pleased that uh, you came up into our office to pay us a visit at halftime. I grew up with Chris Schenkel, and Chris Schenkel to me was the voice of college football. And going for broke for Randy Pessel, and Pessel catches the ball. Chris Schenkel, Keith Jackson, everyone that followed aspired to be those two because they are on the Mount Rushmore College Football Broadcasting. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Vern Lundquist, along with Todd Blackledge and Jill Arrington. Not a bad scene, is it? Vern Lundquist was a great voice for the SEC, and that's what's, I think, neat about college football is that certain voices are associated with leagues and regions. We welcome you to Georgia, Florida once again. Vern Lundquist, I'm an SEC girl. I mean, 3.30 Gator game, Vern's calling that game with that big chuckle and that smile and the oh my. My, oh my. Oh, gosh, get me all excited here, yeah. Oh, jump pass. How about that? Oh, my gosh! Are you kidding me? Welcome, everybody. I'm Brent Musburger. Just a... When they told me I was going to work with Brent, man, I was just, I was floored. <laughs> Kirk Herbstreit, one of the stars at game day. He made it up here. I was a young guy at the time, just in awe of him, and really appreciating everything that I had an opportunity to learn from him, and he was a legend. You are looking live at Bryant-Denny Stadium in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. You are looking live at the Rose Bowl in Pasadena, California. When he would say, You are looking live. I would just be like a fan sitting at home. I just happened to be standing next to him about to call the game. Hogan to the middle, and it's complete. McCaffrey! Will he score on the first play from scrimmage? Yes! Brent wasn't going to come in and be Keith Jackson. Keith Jackson couldn't be Dick Enberg or Kurt Gowdy or Lindsey Nelson or some of the first generation legendary TV voices. All of them were authentic. All of them brought their own personality, their own way of communicating a football game. And that's the beauty of it. Brent has the ability to make it feel huge, to make it feel big. Williams breaks a hole. Williams, hello, record book. Ricky Williams runs to the Hall of Fame. Cuts back. Ricky Williams, touchdown. 60 yards of the record is his. He does it in dramatic fashion. For me, the biggest thrill was growing up listening to these guys and then, in some form or fashion, becoming their colleagues. We really wish you the very best in your retirement. It was the case with Keith Jackson and, of course, Brent. To be able to be colleagues with them after, as a kid growing up, watching their work was enormously, enormously gratifying. Let's not turn the ball over the way. It's been my privilege to sit by your side for 11 years. Thanks. 
for those of us that make a living doing this, hopefully it's evident that we care deeply about the sport and we love it. This is no work assignment. This is no seasonal gig. This isn't a paycheck. This is a dream. High snap, Kelly has to collect it, makes a desperation heave, a crazy carry and a touchdown for the Rebels. The pride that we take when you broadcast a game, you're trying to bring to the viewer even a better experience than what they might get if they're sitting in the stadium. The Bethune-Cookman Wildcats and the Howard Bison are set for their MEAC conference opener. We've done a greater job of bringing in the element of the crowd and the noise and the excitement in the stadium. And so sometimes as broadcasters, we just are quiet on air and we let it breathe. To those fans watching, to the alums, it just means more. So I better hear somewhere in your gut that seed of passion that was planted in you the same way as a college football fan, it was planted in me. And in Keith Jackson, you had that. And in Brent Musburger, you had that. And a lot of my peers and colleagues to this day, they have that. And college football fans demand that. Everything that we understand as the underpinnings of the game today can be traced back to 1984, the Supreme Court ruling, which deregulated television and suddenly shifted power from the NCAA back to the conferences. It led to the breakup of conferences. It led to the college football playoff. Watson, touchdown! Television has been the really big game changer. It's everything for these schools, and it's everything for the networks, too. It's programming. It's the last major foothold as far as keeping over the air and cable television a must-demand product because you have to watch it live. What a catch! You know, there are other ways that you can consume, whether it's you're driving and listening on the radio or looking on your phone. You're doing something wild. With football and television, it makes you sit down and watch. What a catch one-handed! Oh, yeah, I think that's a sports center top 10 play. Television, for the most part, is contrived. It's make-believe. It's inauthentic. Great television is authentic. And Wesley holds it in off the tip. When you simply put the camera on a college football Saturday, and you get all the pageantry and the history and the grand traditions that have been passed down, that bleeds through the screen. And the ball is free! TV has done a very good job of showcasing to America what that really feels like, looks like, tastes like. Touchdown! 